And basically, I'm going to very briefly present uh, the research I made for my master thesis uh, in IHE, which later become a paper in environmental research letters, uh, which is about estimating the extent of groundwater dependence for urban self-supply in continental Africa. So uh, jumping into some context, as you might know, uh, since 2014, half of the world population uh, is urban. So uh, especially in developing countries, this undergoing urbanization is happening mostly or often in informal settlements, which means that uh, public service infrastructure is not uh, growing as fast as, fast as cities are. Uh, and so water utilities capacities are overpassed. Um, so uh, as a consequence, people have to source water from wherever they can find it outside the water uh, distribution of the public networks. And uh, this is uh, how we defined uh, self-supply. And of course, this can come either from wells in the backyards or buying water from a neighbor who has a borehole or from vendors. There's many, many strategies out there. And those that can use groundwater, uh, well, that really depends on the local hydrogeological uh, conditions, on the climate, uh, on availability of other, uh, of other resources. Uh, and um, yeah, and how the city was uh, developed. Um, we know that this is quite widespread, this, this use of, of, uh, of groundwater. Um, however, it's not really, it, it's really underestimated when you look at the monitoring data, especially for SDG6 and for these uh, international platforms, and we find that the biggest reason for that is that national service collect um, the primary source for domestic water, uh, where in reality, it is often a combination of multiple sources. There's different strategies to get water. And so that, um, yeah, of course, uh, it's not reflected. And so because of this, uh, the objective of this research was to present a method and estimates of urban population using groundwater obtained by a self-supply uh, for the entire African continent uh, that's, that is without islands. Uh, here is the published paper in case you want to dig further. These are just 10 minutes, so I'm just going to briefly explain a little bit of it. So how did we do this? Basically, um, we took a lot of literature of in the field, people observing how were people obtaining uh, groundwater for self-supply. Uh, we talked to experts and so, and so we developed um, two ways to approach this. The first one was the maximum urban population to use groundwater obtained by a self-supply. That is the maximum total amount of people that could possibly use groundwater only based on the hydrogeological conditions uh, on areas densely enough to be considered cities, densely populated enough to be considered cities. So for these, we took uh, groundwater storage, groundwater productivity, and depth to groundwater. And then in a second phase, we calculated the likely urban population to use groundwater obtained by a self-supply. For these, we used 10 sample cities. Um, and for these, we considered variables that could limit or, or um, condition the use of groundwater for self-supply. Like for example, proximity to surface water as it is often preferred if it's closer and more accessible. Um, the area of public water supply, of course, if you are outside of the, of the area of the public water supply, you're more likely to have to search uh, other sources like groundwater, socioeconomic distribution, uh, we, we see how that changes the technology used, as in if you are very rich, you probably can afford to build a borehole within your property, uh, but if you have really low income, then uh, probably you depend on springs or 
uh, shallow groundwater to access it. And um, of course, there are some cities where there are restrictions to use groundwater. So we took that into account. So that's, that's basically the two uh, measures we, we calculated. All of the input data was uh, spatially distributed, uh, open data uh, that you can all find. Uh, this was all prepared in a GIS environment where we then used conditional uh, algorithms to, to evaluate how these things interacted. And uh, yeah, so now jumping into the big results we got, um, so basically the potential self-supply groundwater use, we estimate that only considering hydrogeological conditions, approximately 79% of total, uh, total urban population could potentially use groundwater to meet their domestic needs. Uh, here's a map of the, of the distribution of that population. Again, it's uh, urban population that we're looking at. Uh, and yeah, that's uh, assumed to uh, near Nigeria and uh, Uganda, Tanzania, and Kenya. Um, and then uh, the 10 cities we took into account were Arusha, Kampala, Kano, Addis Ababa, Kinshasa, Lagos, Nairobi, Maputo, Dodoma, and Lusaka, because they had um, these available data were uh, big cities. And so, uh, basically, from these results, we obtained that uh, about 32% of, uh, of uh, the urban uh, African population are likely to use groundwater obtained by a self-supply. Um, earlier studies uh, from 2011 uh, pointed that an estimated of 30% or more of the urban population depends on wells, boreholes, or springs as their primary source of drinking water. These also considered uh, South Asia. So in this context, um, yeah, our result resembles this, this previous estimation. And uh, yeah, um, about this method that we developed, of course, it has some limitations. Uh, for example, even in cities with very favorable um, groundwater with very favorable hydrogeological conditions. They not necessarily use uh, the groundwater because there are other sources. So that, that's uh, difficult to take into account in these kind of uh, methods. Of course, um, the possibility of using the groundwater uh, taking into account the quality was not taken into account. Um, local deviations or groundwater or water governance arrangements are not captured by this simplified urban analysis. Um, and also the hydrogeological input data has a resolution of uh, uh, 25 square kilometers, which often means that there's just like three or four of these in a, in a medium sized city. Um, so of course it does not capture the uh, heterogeneity of uh, hydrogeology, as we know it's quite heterogeneous. But however, it's a it's a first um, it's a first attempt to get data from um, open data that's in a large scale that can tell us something about the region, but could also be helpful in telling us what's happening in the city. And so what are the implications of this study? Well, first, it helps us understand the scale and magnitude of potential and likely groundwater use in urban sub-Saharan Africa. Um, clearly, household investments are significant and they should be recognized as such. What we mean by this is that, um, yeah, to access uh, um, hand dog wells in the backyard or to pay for neighbors selling water from their boreholes or so and so requires some investment that it's not just that we're not realizing of groundwater use, uh, but we're not realizing of, of what it entails. Um, and uh, also from what we observed in many urban African contexts, uh, self-supply using groundwater for domestic water 
uh, is here for the foreseeable future. So um, yeah, for the, for the immediate future, maybe instead of assuming that self-supply will no longer be needed, we should aim at making it um, safe and sustainable. So yeah, basically that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Arthur. And, <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, yes, and uh, while we are waiting, uh, maybe a number of questions from the audience or from co-panelists, of course, if there are any. I would have one uh, to start with. Perhaps uh, maybe, and that's not maybe for the audience a bit ni nice to understand a bit better. What is the difference between the likely and potential use uh, of groundwater? These different numbers. Uh, you have, I think 79% uh, is uh, potentially uh, potential self supply. Uh, and so, what, what can, you, can you repeat or explain a little bit more on um, what that number, that figure means actually, that almost 80% has that potential? Yeah, by potential, basically, what we wanted to see is if uh, just by looking at hydrogeological conditions, uh, what was the percentage of people who could, uh, living in cities, mm -hmm. use self supply? Like, okay, I'm just uh, here, and how how many people could just hand dog a well or yeah. or install a borehole just based on the let's say hydrogeological availability. So, so that so, th yeah. that's the potential. Exactly. And so what you're saying is that that potential, which is very large, uh, the, what, what would be the way forward to then optimize that potential? I mean, I know that so that depends of course on resources, technical support, et cetera, right? But what do you think would be a, a large game changer to, to, to increase that, that, that use or that, that potential? Yeah, I, I think that's a that's a very good question, and uh, I guess it has a lot of uh, nuances. But um, I True. think that it's it's important to look at it because uh, as as uh, as we conclude, self supply is kind of there to stay in a sense of uh, it allows people to access water when it's not really in the uh, available in the public networks, just because infrastructure is not possible yeah. to grow it as much. So um, if there was a way to make policies into, uh, instead of spending a lot of money in trying to extend the infrastructure, more like spending resources on, okay, let's find a way to make self-supply safe and sustainable by, I don't know, either education sources or yeah. uh, different approaches maybe this this uh, potential figure could could help to see like okay maybe in places that haven't realized they have a lot of uh, water availability we could do more yeah so i think that's uh, that's one way to interpret <laughs> you're actually uh, uh, um, indirectly responding to rafael abina's question on uh, how do you make groundwater safe and sustainable given that there's no policy to manage its abstraction? Uh, and I think you're trying to say that, right? Through awareness raising, education. Anything yeah. you want to add to that? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure, that's a big thing. For sure, that's a big thing. Pollution is a big thing. We we um, tried to consider it in the study, but there was just not enough data to go with it. But for sure... Uh, the safe part of it is, of course, uh, maybe the most uh, yeah. urgent one. And um, uh, unfortunately, I don't have uh, uh, an easy answer for that. Sure. But it, yeah. it's it's definitely maybe the most important criteria to yeah. to offer safe water for all. But um, yeah, I mean, but even in these uh, urban groundwater environments, there's a lot of study on how to to make it more um, so that the urban environments don't pollute water as much. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's also Gopa Kumar was mentioning the same from the audience that uh, for urban population to use groundwater for self-supply, we meet, need to ensure that the sources are free of pollution. And that's also where awareness raising and also technical training and support can, can definitely play a big role. 
besides having the availability to water, it also has to be, of course, water free of contamination, microbiological and chemical yeah. contamination. For sure. Um, yeah, we are maybe last question. Um, there is, and then we need to move on. Uh, is there any projection made? At, Olawala is asking in the research in terms of the number of people that will be depending on, I think, yeah, SS self supply, of course, in the future. So, projections on the number of people that will be depending on self supply in the future. Uh, um, do, you, do you follow the question? Yeah, I think I do. We didn't look into the future. Actually, the figures I showed, I forgot to mention, they are 20, 2015 based, like they are based on, um, on yeah. a population from 2015. Um, well, I, I, I think that uh, the trends we looked at uh, without having numbers for it, I mm -hmm. think it will increase just because of the fact that urbanization is increasing. Um, it is expected, I think, that by 2050, that 70% of population will live in cities. So yeah, I think urbanization is one of the biggest game changers since mm -hmm. um, yeah the last century. Mm -hmm. And um, so yeah, I, I would think that that number is going to grow, but exactly we, we yeah. have to see. And I guess indeed, and having. Uh, this huge issue of urbanization also calls for, okay, self-supply uh, or finding or protecting areas of supply where we know that uh, through hydrological studies that uh, that it is sustainable to extract a, norm a certain amount, of course, linking to low cost infrastructure somehow would be a way to deal with this among many challenges that we need to overcome. 